today, what we are going to observe is a gospel-centered community. What is a gospel-centered community? Why is a gospel-centered community important? Uh, this is what we're going to be unpacking this morning, okay? Um, when I was in college, uh, and I went to where? Do you guys know? Indiana University. IU. Okay, that, that's our thing. Uh, yes, IU. All right. What? McDonald's? Yes, I got fat at university. That's correct. It's because of McDonald's. I had a McDonald's at the basement of my dormitory. Um, so I went to Indiana University. I, I lived in Indiana from 2002 until 2009, and then I left for Korea in 2009. Um, in 2007, uh, I had just graduated. My life was just changing um, back into the church uh, during that time. And there was actually a movie, like this is after I moved in uh, to that home next to the, the small Korean church on 3rd on Street. Um, there was this movie I watched, and I watched it on my own. I don't know if you guys probably don't know it. it it's an old movie. Uh, but it's called Into the Wild. Has anyone ever heard of this movie? Okay. First of all, first of all, if you are under the age of 18 and you're saying, oh, you shouldn't have watched this movie. It's rated R. Dang. <laughs> you know, that's bad. All right. So anyway, um, but there was this movie called Into the Wild. Um, it's actually based on a true story. This is an indie movie. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I, I used to go, I was like in this phase where I loved indie movies because they were just so raw. They, uh, they just kind of showed things as they were. They weren't trying to do the touch-ups. It's not like Marvel Avengers where they're trying to make like everything cool and bright and, you know, punchy and stuff like that. This was just, yeah, yeah th this was just one of those indie movies. It's just really real. Um, this movie, Into the Wild, is actually about a real man. His name is Christopher McCandless. Um, he uh, was a young man at the time. This is a, about his life from, like, I think uh, 19, the late 1980s to the early 1990s. Uh, Christopher McCandless uh, lived in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, this man um, all of a sudden just decided, you know what? I just want to go on my own adventure. And so without telling his family, he left Atlanta, Georgia. Like, he said nothing to his family. He left Atlanta, Georgia, and decided to journey his way to Alaska, Healy, Alaska. He traveled a bit more than 5,000 miles, which is about 8,000 kilometers. Um, and he just traveled through the United States of America, um, made his way through Canada, and then arrived to Alaska. And uh, that's kind of where his life ended. Um, Along his journey, he meets a lot of interesting new people, uh, people who kind of shape his thoughts, that shape his character, you know, that shape his life. Um, and then finally, he gets to Alaska, and he's about 24 years old at this time in 1992. He gets to Alaska. He finds this empty, broken-down school bus, and he decides to make that his home. Um, the school bus is still there today, so if you ever visit Healy, Alaska with your family, you can go and check it out. Um, I believe they give tours of that bus. Um, but he lived in that bus for a few months, I think about 140 or 150 days or something like that. Um, he lived in that school bus, and he wasn't a dumb guy. Like, he had a guidebook with him. Um, he bought one to make sure that he was eating the right fruit, the right foods, um, and also what other foods to avoid because he was living in the wilderness, and he was all alone. One thing that Christopher McCandless didn't know was that there's this uh, seed, a wild potato seed. In a guidebook, wild potato seeds are, are actually, they're deemed as harmless. But the thing is, is when you eat it in large amounts, they contain this amino acid that causes um, a disease to form inside your body. And this disease is called latherism. Okay? Uh, latherism is a disease where your body because of that, the buildup of that amino acid, the body begins to shut down and it starves itself. And so you're just unable to eat. Um, and so Christopher McCandless started losing weight, um, but he didn't know. He thought he was just sick. And then it got too late to the point where he couldn't, he was crying out for help, but he was too weak to reach out for help. Um, he, uh, obviously there weren't cell phones, like smartphones at that time, it was 1992. Um, and so Christopher McCandless died in that school bus all by himself. Um, a few months later, or, 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 or a month or so later, um, 
these hunters were going around uh, that area, and they found the school bus, and they found Christopher McCandless's body. Um, he had journals that he had written throughout his entire trip, which is why we know about his life story, because he wrote about everything in his life. Like, his journals were quite extensive. Um, and there's this one phrase that he wrote near the end of his life, and they could tell that he wrote it towards the end of his life because his handwriting was extremely, like, wobbly. It wasn't, it wasn't firm. It wasn't straight. And this is what this movie is known for, is this last line. Again, he's living alone. What he writes is this, happiness is only real when shared. Happiness is only real when shared. And we don't know this, but uh, at the end of the movie, Christopher McCandless, he goes, he, like, as he's dying, like, he's, he's like, nearing his final breaths, and he envisions what life would have been like if rather than leaving his family, if he had gone to them to hug them and to be welcomed by them again and to be with them again. And that's how the movie sort of ends. Um, but this quote kind of stuck with me a lot uh, because, like I said to you guys before, in 2007, that was the year that God kind of brought me back to my Christian faith. That was the year that God brought me back to the Christian church. Um, I had been away for a number of years, and then uh, God brought me back that year. And one of the things that uh, I took away from this, what struck me about this, is that uh, life is, life is, life is, Jem Youth, life is best experience when it is shared. There's a deep truth to this statement. And if you think about it, biblically, that's how God made us. He made us, flip your sermon note cards on the back, this is the first fill in the blank, God made us for community, okay? God made us for community, right? You usually laugh harder when you're laughing with someone. If you're laughing alone, that's like, that's like borderline, like, bichin saram, okay? You're a crazy person, all right? But when you're laughing with people, that laughter can go for hours, if even. Like, if, if you ever met my sisters and I, I think I've told you guys this before, but when my, my, when my family and I, when, we're, when we, we have, like, those family gatherings during uh, American Thanksgiving and we're in Vegas or we're in Abbotsford, like, I'm telling you, um, you think you can hear me from a mile away? You put me and my second sister, my third sister, my first sister, you put all four of us together, you can hear us from, like, miles away. Uh, we are super loud to the point where I think my brother-in-laws, they always go out of the house for a moment uh, just to like kind of like relax from us. But we just love to laugh. We love to be with each other. And, and that's just, again, life is best experience when shared. Um, have you ever known that when you eat alone, you eat whatever amount you do, but when you eat with people, that increases 50 to 75%. 사람들이랑 같이 먹을 때는 you eat more than you usually would. Why? Because you're fellowshipping over food. Like, that's really important. Uh, when you're sharing food with others and you're, and you're fellowshipping with others, you tend to eat more. Uh, you're able to go through your frustrations in a healthier way when you actually share those frustrations with someone. When you have someone to share them with and you have someone walking beside you, it actually helps you to digest your emotions and your frustrations and your hurt in a lot healthier way when that is shared with someone. There is something, Jem Youth, very special that occurs when life is shared with others. Again, God made us for this. He made us for community. And here's the thing. If God made us for this, then us as the body of Christ, as God's people, shouldn't we be this? Amen? Amen? a place where people can share with one another and share in each other's presence. Now, I know some of you guys, uh, you don't have a lot of church friends. Even though our youth ministry is this big, some of you guys might have that argument or that objection. PJ, uh, you know, yes, God made us for community, and I have a community. Like, I have all of my school friends. Uh, we're really close. Like, I'm closer to them than I am with the body of Christ or with people of our church community. And the thing is, there's a difference, though. There's a difference between you sharing life with people outside of the community of faith and sharing your life with people inside the community of faith. And the difference is this. It's really simple. Your life, when you share it with the community of faith, you're sharing life in Jesus Christ. 
you're sharing life in Jesus Christ. When you're sharing life with people outside of the community of faith, you're sharing life. That's great. Yeah, you have some form of a community, but the essence of that community is not in Jesus Christ. That is outside of Jesus Christ. It is apart from Jesus Christ. When you come together, though, within the church, within the body of Christ, you begin to share life in Jesus Christ. Not just sharing life, but you're sharing it in someone V1. And so the second blank that you have on your sermon note cards is we were made to share life in Christ. You weren't just made to share life. You were made to share it in Jesus Christ. Um, Life that is shared outside of Jesus Christ is extremely different. And I just want to give you guys one example this morning. Uh, The reason why communities outside of Jesus Christ aren't the same as growing within the community of faith within the body of Christ. The reason or one of the biggest differences between those two is that people, communities who live outside of Jesus Christ, they calculate. They calculate a lot. It's always give and take. Like if I'm investing in this much, then they should be giving me this much in return. If that's not the case, then this isn't worth it. Uh, you calculate everything. Oh, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if, if they're investing in me in that much, then I got to invest in them in that much. And, and, and that's sort of how it goes. It's calculated. But when you're in Jesus Christ and you're sharing life in Jesus Christ, there is no calculating, Jemu. The gospel teaches us, the gospel teaches us Jesus did not calculate when he died for you, when he died for me. Jesus didn't calculate. Mm, is dying for Josh worth it? Like I'm giving him eternity and then most likely, Josh will probably give me only 30% of his life, 40% of his life, not even close to half. Is that worth it? I don't know. Should I die for Josh? Maybe. No, Jesus never said anything like that. Jesus, rather, when he died on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. Why? They don't know what they're doing. Jesus never calculated if dying for you was worth it he did it that's a part of the gospel story and the thing is is Jesus' disciples they struggled with this um, pastor park shared this last week and i wanted to share this with you guys this week um, in matthew chapter 18 verse 21 peter says this to jesus he says then peter came up and said to him lord how often will my brother sin against me and i forgive him as many as seven times Right? And Peter, he's not asking this in an innocent manner. Peter is asking this, saying, Jesus, I'm forgiving someone seven times. That's a lot. Like, and, and again, the number seven has meaning in the Bible. The number seven means complete, perfect, whole. And so Peter is basically saying, if I forgive my brother who sins against me over and over and over, if I forgive him seven times, that should be more than enough. Isn't that more? Isn't that more than good enough, Jesus? Aren't I doing Well, and then Jesus responds to Peter by challenging him with this. He says, Jesus says to Peter, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So, is Jesus giving us an exact number? Right? Uh, Let's say if, uh, who's here? Uh, If Inyong sins against me 77 times, I can forgive it up to 77, but if she pushes me to 78, girl, we're done. No more. Uh, No more forgiveness. I have emptied myself, and now I'm at empty, empty. There's none left in the canister. 78, I can't do that, okay? Um, That is not what Jesus is saying. It is not an exact number. What Jesus is actually doing is he's he's taking Peter's number of perfection, number seven, and he's multiplying that. And he's saying it's not about seven times peter but actually you shouldn't even calculate how many times you've forgiven someone you're not supposed to count how much you forgive someone how much you're showing someone grace you're not supposed to calculate those things in jesus christ there is no calculating why because god does not calculate with us god doesn't calculate how many times he had to forgive you since the day you were born since your first sin God doesn't calculate how much grace he's showing to you. He simply gives it to you. You see, 
This is why the community that is shared outside of Jesus and a community that is shared in Jesus, this is one of the defining characteristics. A community that is shared in Jesus, there is no calculating. We struggle with that. We battle with that. But that's what, we, that's what we're supposed to battle with is we're not supposed to calculate. We're not supposed to calculate how many times this person did this against me or this person spoke that against me or this person didn't do that or this person isn't doing this. Da, 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 da. You, you're, that, that's not the Christian life. Growing as a community of faith in Jesus Christ is not about calculating. The gospel does not teach us that, Gem Youth. Rather, the gospel teaches us God's amazing grace. The Bible teaches us how unfailing and how unconditional God's love really is. The Bible teaches us that so long as we truly repent deep in our hearts for the things that we have done wrong against God, whether at home or at school or at work or at church or on the street or in our own personal rooms, God will always forgive you. This is my first takeaway, Gem Youth. Jesus teaches us not to calculate in our relationships with one another. We are not to calculate. Oh, this person only did this much for me. Ah, uh, is it worth it? Well, remember Jesus on the cross who died for you. Remember how many times God's forgiven you. Yes, that's why when we, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, that's what that phrase means. Father, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who have trespassed against me. Father, for as long as I know that I am receiving your forgiveness, that, I am, that I'm receiving that, then help me to forgive those who have done wrong against me as well. That is the practice. That is the prayer. That is a gospel-centered community. There's no calculating. Right, my mom, I told you guys when I was growing up, I loved giving things away. Whenever someone needed something, they don't have a sungyong check, oh, take mine. It's okay. My mom and dad bought it for me. I don't know how much it costs though, but yeah, go ahead and take it. That's all right. And then my mom and dad would be like, Hyunjuna, sungyong check oh, I gave it to someone on my church because they didn't have a Bible. What? You know, like it's one of those like Korean English Bibles. They're probably like 65 bucks or something like that. And I just, you know, gave it away, you know, like my toys, things like that. Like, I would, just, I would just get, oh, you don't have a Nintendo? Hey, yeah, borrow mine. You know, you like you to take it. I can't even play it at home right now because my mom will let me. But if you can play it, yeah, go ahead and take it home. You know, like, I would just give things away. And it, came, it got to the point where my mom told me one day, she was like, Hyunjuna, Hyunjuna, Hyunjuna. one day, one day, one day, you're going to give me away to a kid that doesn't have a mom. And you're going to say, oh, you need a mom? Well, here's my mom. Go ahead and take my mom and you can go ahead and have her. And my mom felt like that. She, she just felt like that. But there, there's no calculating, guys. Yes, I might have wasted a lot of my parents' money. Uh, but there's no calculating there isn't you're not supposed to calculate in Jesus Christ because we all live by the grace of God amen amen the Pharisees calculated they calculated how many times people were reading the Bible how much of the Bible they had memorized how many times they were uh, doing their prayer throughout the day how many times they were uh, their tithing to God how much they were giving to God and so forth they calculated everything and those were the people that Jesus said away from me you brood of vipers. That is not what my heavenly father kingdom is about. That is not what his kingdom is about. Don't calculate. We all live by the grace of God. That's a third blank. We must not calculate, Jemmy, because God does not calculate with us. And the thing is, is when you look at the early church, this is what they practiced, okay? So we're going to look at today's passage. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, there are five things that the early church practiced. And these are the five things that I would love to see our youth ministry practice, okay? In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, this is what happens, okay, with the early church. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. 
There are five things that the early church practiced. Five things that they never calculated. Five things that they just simply did. The first one is they got together to learn God's word. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, meaning they devoted themselves to God's word. And they didn't calculate that. They didn't calculate, oh, I read the Bible five minutes today. Oh, I read it ten minutes today. Oh, I did my devotional for today. That's it with God's word. No, they never calculated that. This was a, a regular practice for the people of God to come together, to read the word together, to receive from God together so that they could grow together in God's word. This was something that they practiced. The second thing that the early church did was they had fellowship. They devoted themselves to fellowship. And we have fellowship broken up into two parts. The first part of fellowship is they fellowshiped over food. Fellowshipping over food is awesome. I had the grade 12 boys come over to my house in Langley. Uh, uh, was it last month, you guys? Was it last month? Right? March? It was in March? Right? I think so. Yeah, they came over. My wife and I, we cooked uh, 48 uh, chicken thighs. And uh, I made pot roast uh, with gravy and salad. And my wife made macarons. And we had a feast of a feast. And we killed it. Like, I didn't think they were going to eat it all. Uh, and, 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 and we had fellowship with one another. And afterwards, we went and we played basketball. And then I schooled all of them, you know, and so forth and, and whatnot. Uh, I'm just kidding. I only made one shot. Um, but anyway, we had, we had a fun time. And this is a part of fellowship, breaking bread over food, like having fellowship over food. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a biblical thing. It is a gospel-centered community thing. And another part of that fellowship was they prayed for one another. Praying for each other is, a very, is supposed to be a very common practice. Praying for your brothers, praying for your sisters, this is supposed to be a very common practice. Attending the temple is the fourth thing. They went to church together. They went to the house of God and they worshipped him. They praised him. They did all of that together. They did that as a family in Christ. And the last thing was they praised God. Whenever there was a praise report to uh, be, 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 be given and to be shared, they praised God for that. Like, again, uh, you know, it was the same thing where, um, I don't know if you guys remember that illustration, this guy named Mark Buchanan who used to live in Duncan, uh, he wrote a book called The Rest of God. It's a really good book. Um, I, I encourage you guys to read it. Um, went to Africa on a mission trip, and he was in a church community there uh, speaking uh, for a seminar, and they were, they were having a time of sharing. And this one African woman came up, and she came up to the microphone, and she was like, I just want to praise God because he gave me shoes. He gave me new shoes. And then Mark Buchanan looked at her shoes, and what kind of shoes were they? Oh, they were old. They were messed up. They were broken shoes. They had holes in them. They weren't new at all, and he was really confused. But this lady was so, so happy. She was praising God, and she called him a new pair of shoes because she had been going through her life every day without a pair of shoes. And so the community of God came together and they praised God for a new pair of shoes. Even though they were old, worn, and torn, they came together and they praised God for that. This was an early practice also for the early church. These are the five things that the early church practiced. Learning God's word together. Having fellowship over food and prayer. Sharing everything that they had going to the house of God together and praising God whenever he did an amazing thing in someone's life, whether big or small. And the reason why the early church practiced this is because they were practicing sharing the heart of the gospel with everyone that was in their community. They wanted everyone in their community to meet Jesus Christ. They wanted everyone in their community to know about Jesus Christ. They wanted everyone in their community to live a transformed life, a new life in Jesus Christ. The early church practiced these things because their aim was this. Their aim was to give every person in their church community an opportunity to meet Jesus. Gem Youth, that is, that is our aim as well. This is my second and last takeaway. The heart of a gospel-centered community is to share Jesus with others. Through our words, through our actions, through our attitudes, 
by the way that we talk to each other. We're supposed to help each other meet Jesus. We're supposed to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. This is the sole aim of the gospel center community. is so that every single person here in Vision Hall, the reason why Gem Youth Ministry exists, the reason why GCC is here, is so that every person who is in our church community, every person here, that they would get to meet Jesus through you. That they would get to meet Jesus through your words, that they would get to meet Jesus through your actions, that they would get to meet Jesus through your fellowship with one another, that they would get to meet with Jesus as you learn about God's word with each other, that they would get to meet Jesus as you pray for one another, that they would get to meet Jesus as you share things for friends who are in need of things, uh, that they would get to meet Jesus uh, when you come to church together and you praise God together. All of this is so that every single person in the church community would get to really meet Jesus. That's the heart of the gospel. I don't know if you guys remember, three years ago, one of our youth students in Clay, uh, their apartment burned. It was in Langley. I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was an apartment complex that burned. And all the floors, the people who were on the top three, they lost everything. Um, this man had just moved in there. Well, Pastor Phil and I, we went to that house, house community. We went there to, to help that student because we had just heard the news. And I saw the fire. The fire trucks were there. They were putting it all out. And... All of the residents, they put them on this bus. They, they brought out one of the TransLink buses, and it was not in service, but then they had the residents, like, fill up those buses in there. And I, I was sitting there with the youth student, and there was this gentleman sitting across from me, and he had just moved in, just moved in three months before, just moved in, thought he didn't have enough time to get insurance coverage and lost everything, everything. But the same was with our students' family. And word got out, and our church community, people started donating things, pooling together money to help this family when they were in a great time of need because they lost everything. And they didn't have insurance coverage to get any of it back. And so our church community, we pulled together as much as we could and donated things that they could use so that their need would be fulfilled. Why did we do that? Is it because we're just trying to be good people? No. No, it's because through that provision, through that providing and sharing, that we would get to share the heart of the gospel, that we would get to share the heart of God, that we would get to share Jesus with that family. Amen? This is a gospel-centered community, Gem Youth. This is how the church is supposed to be. And the thing is this, and I want to close here. You cannot, you cannot grow in your walk with Jesus Christ apart from the body of Christ. It's not possible. You can't. In John chapter 15, verse 5, what does Jesus say? Towards the end of verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now listen very carefully. If Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, think very carefully. Envision the church. The head of the church is who? The head of the church is who? Jesus, right? The head of the church is Jesus. The church is the what? The body of Christ. So then if Jesus and his body is the church, and Jesus says in John 55, apart from me, you can do nothing, then it's the same thing apart from the body of Christ. You cannot grow. You cannot grow in your walk with Christ. It's not possible. You cannot do anything for the kingdom of God apart from the body of Christ. And that is why, Gem Youth, everything that we do here in this ministry is to help you to meet Jesus. It's to help you to deepen your personal commitment to Jesus Christ. It's to help you to do what your brothers and sisters did last week where you would come to a point in your walk with Christ where you're willing to truly commit to him and you will, you're not afraid to share that with people. You, I want to commit my life to Christ. That's what baptism and confirmation is. It is about committing your life to Christ and the community of faith 
as a gospel-centered community, we're supposed to encourage each other in this way so that you would come to a point in your walk with Jesus where you are growing in your personal commitment to him. Everything that we do is supposed to help you to grow. That's what we're supposed to be about. And that's why for those of you who come out on Sundays, But if you don't come out on Friday youth nights, if you don't come out to be with a small group, if you don't come out to really dig into God's word and to grow with it, it doesn't work. It won't work. You won't. Your faith will either be stagnant or you'll start to decline and you'll start to lose it. And you'll be like, what was this all about? Why am I doing this? Well, it's because you've been trying to pursue your personal walk with Jesus Christ all by yourself apart from the body of Christ. But you cannot do that because Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So then you must rethink. If you really want your faith to grow, if you really want your relationship with Jesus to grow, it can only be done within the body of Christ. Because within the body of Christ, that's what we do, is we remind you about Jesus. We remind you about what he did. We remind you about what's true. We remind you that God is greater than all of your problems. We remind you that you are no longer bound to your sin. We remind you that Jesus died for all of that, that there is victory in him. Amen. Amen. Everything is to point you to Jesus Christ. Everything. For some of you guys, when I ask you about salvation, it is Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen. Amen. Only Jesus can save. Which is why everything that we do in this community is about helping you to meet with him and to grow in him. Ultimately, that you would be saved. 